Jim Lyle to the stage this afternoon. Of course, he's no stranger to the stage. Been on it many times. You know, we are very fortunate here, in all honesty, to have someone of Dr. Lyle's caliber. He's been here 12 years, his 13th year. And I think he's given a presentation nearly every single dean semester. You might have missed one or two in the last 12 years, one or two, no. but, but not very many. And his presentations are always so terrific. Um, I think most of you know Dr. Lyle, who uh, served as chair of the theater department for his first 12 years. Or for, right, the last eight. Last eight. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, please join me in welcoming our own Dr. Thank you, Chad. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Stebbins, and thank you to all of you for coming this afternoon. This room is always a reminder because I count the banners. I came Russia, and we just work our way around. That's how I can remember how long I've been here. This afternoon, we're going to talk about a favorite author of mine, uh, a favorite author of lots of people, Noel Coward. And sort of by way of introduction and overture, let me play you one of his most popular compositions. He was a playwright, he was a composer, he was an actor, you name it, he was able to pretty much do it. And this is one of his most popular compositions and it says a lot about who he is. This is called Mad Dogs and Englishmen Go Out in the Midday Sun. And what you want to hear is um, the wit, the satire, and the absolutely charming use of language because he really, really adores the way language sounds. And this is a spoof on people who don't know when to get out of the hot summer afternoon. And of course, Ray Noble's orchestra. In tropical climes, there are certain times of day when all the citizens retire to take their clothes off and perspire. It's one of those rules the greatest fools obey because the sun is far too sultry and one must avoid its ultraviolet ray. The natives grieve when the white men leave their huts because they're obviously, definitely nuts. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. The Japanese don't care to, the Chinese wouldn't dare to. Hindus and Argentines sleep firmly from 12 to 1, but Englishmen deter star siesta. In the Philippines, they have lovely screens to protect you from the glare. In the Malay states, there are hats like plates which the Britishers won't wear. At 12 noon, the natives swoon and no further work is done. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. It's such a surprise for the Eastern eyes to see that though the English are effete, they're quite impervious to heat. When the white man rides, every native hides in glee. Because the simple creatures hope he will impale his solar topi on a tree. It seems such a shame when the English claim the earth that they give rise to such hilarity and mirth. <laughs> <laughs> Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. The toughest Burmese bandit can never understand it. In Rangoon, the heat of noon is just what the natives shun. They put the scotch or ride down and lie down. In a jungle town where the sun beats down to the rage of man and beast, the English garb of the English Saab merely gets a bit more creased. In Bangkok, at 12 o'clock, they foam at the mouth and run. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. The smallest melee rabbit deplores its foolish habit. In Hong Kong, they strike a gong and fire off a noonday gun to reprimand each inmate who's in late. In the mangrove swamps by the python rumps, there is peace from 12 to 2. Even caribous lie around and snooze, for there's nothing else to do. In Bengal, to move at all is seldom if ever done. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday, 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 out in the midday sun. There you go. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Um, the song actually had a point of controversy in it once upon a time. 
at the end of the second refrain where it talks about in Bangkok at 12 o'clock they foam at the mouth and run, there was evidently a dinner party argument between Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill about where that occurred in the song. And so it turned out that Franklin Roosevelt was right and Winston Churchill accepted defeat like a, like a grown-up man. Noel Coward was born in 1899, and it's a fortuitous sort of time to be born, I think, because he lived until 1974. And so that's a really marvelous period to be alive and alert and conscious. And one of the things I envy about Coward and other people whose careers were in that sort of generation, they all knew each other. Um, so working together, hearing of one another, crossing paths, all sorts of things. It's a, a very interesting sort of dynamic that the folks have. Noel Coward made his stage debut at the age of 11. His mother was a very supportive uh, and powerful force. What happened was he had been singing around for relatives and stuff, which he declared um, were to the embarrassment of himself and the relatives. But mom decided that he had the aptitude and needed to go on the stage. And so they found an ad in a paper where a person was directing a play looking for a talented and attractive boy. And as he says in his autobiography, I knew I was talented, and you clean me up and I'm marginally attractive, so she had to hire me. And so she, in fact, did. It wasn't long before Coward fell under the wonderful influence of this fellow right here. Um, this, is the, this is the educational part of our program, because you may not have heard of Charles Hawtrey. Charles Hawtrey was an actor manager in England, uh, in the tradition of the great actor managers, and Coward only worked with him for a couple of weeks. But he said in those two weeks, he learned so much about comedy and timing and stagecraft and the theater that it really stood him in good stead for the rest of his life. And I'm glad because he didn't go to school. He didn't have really a lot of schooling, a lot of training. He learned it by doing it from the age of 11. And he had plenty of opportunities. The center picture, these are different periods, no particular chronology. But the center picture uh, I threw in there because he has a lot of experience in review and uh, cabaret acts and things like that. In the United States, we had vaudeville. And in England, the tradition was called music hall, a program of variety entertainment with songs and dances and snappy patter and trained dog acts and stuff like that. And so there were several producers who would stage these things as an evening's entertainment. And Coward proved very facile when it came to writing sketches uh, and music. He wrote over 300 songs in his career. Mad Dogs and Englishmen among them, and one more I'm going to play for you later, which is my favorite. Um, over there is uh, Noel Coward as Slightly in Peter Pan, a role that he played for a while. And then this is a role he detested, but it's a nice picture. It's a play called The Night of the Burning Pestle, and he thought he was a little too intense, but the director liked him, so it was pretty good. What I'd like to do is sort of talk about his career and his development in terms of Four of his major works, which I think um, sort of show nice milestones of his career and also different stages in his development and different stages of his relationship to planet Earth and the other people there and the kind of work he continued to do. The Vortex, 1924. This was Coward's first big theatrical critical hit. It's a remarkable thing because it's a very unattractive subject. We think of Noel Coward as bright, sparkly, you know, witty patter, and he'll get there. But this play, he says it himself that his intention in writing this play was to create a whacking good role for himself. And that's what he had in mind to do. And so he did. Um, and it's a play that's really quite remarkable because Lillian Braithwaite here, which is a great name anyway, Lillian Braithwaite, played his mom. And the conceit of the play is that this young man is horribly embarrassed by his mother because she refuses to act her age, basically. She's neglected her husband, he goes off and does his own thing, and she takes a succession of very young lovers. And her son thinks she's making a spectacle of herself, so he goes off to France to be a musician, and he returns with moderate success and a cocaine habit. Also, on uh, 1924, yeah. So we've got a cocaine habit and a young man embarrassed by his mom, and his mom is kind of confused as it works out, um, but that was the show. And what happened was Coward, as he wrote this thing, realized that act two was too short. As it is now, structurally, it feels very odd the way it ends, um, but I can imagine it being theatrically pretty effective. So he rewrote it to make it more substantial, which happened to mean more lines for him. So the woman originally scheduled to play Florence, her name was Katie Cutler, all of a sudden just decided she wasn't going to rehearse the play anymore. 
And so they cajoled, they asked, they pleaded, and finally they're like, we've got to find somebody else. And so they went and talked to Lillian Braithwaite, learned her part in two days so that she could spend the rest of the time figuring things out. Poor Katie Cutler didn't get to do the part, which would have been kind of terrific. But how she got the role is the point of the story. After Katie Cutler decided she wasn't going to play, Noel Coward and everybody are trying to find the other actresses who could do that role. And then all of a sudden he went, wait a minute, what if we go completely opposite and rely on somebody who can actually act and, and not necessarily worry about the type of person that we're playing? And that's where Lillian Braithwaite came into the picture, and they were both very successful in the role. Huge critical and commercial success. As Noel Coward says, he's got two volumes of autobiography. One is called Present Indicative, and the future is called, the second one is called Future Imperative, I think? I can't remember. Future Imperfect, I think, yeah. Here we go. I just want to share a bit of this with you. After the show opened, The Vortex, produced on November 25th at the Everyman Theater, Hampstead. The Everyman Theater was part of the problem hiring actors for this production because the rule at Everyman Theater was you couldn't make more than five pounds a week. Didn't matter who you were. So that was kind of the deal with that. And if it was successful enough to transfer to the West End, then you reverted to your original salary. But hmm. It was an immediate success and established me both as a playwright and as an actor, which was very fortunate because up until then I had not proved myself to be so hot in either capacity. With this success came many pleasurable trappings. A car, new suits, silk shirts, an extravagant amount of pajamas and dressing gowns, and a still more extravagant amount of publicity. I was photographed and interviewed and photographed again. In the street, in the park, in my dressing room, at my piano, with my dear old mother, without my dear old mother. And on one occasion, sitting up in an over-elaborate bed looking like a heavily doped Chinese illusionist. The last photograph, I believe, did me a good deal of harm. People glancing at it concluded at once, and with a certain justification, that I was undoubtedly a weedy sensualist in the last stages of physical and moral degeneration, and that they had better hurry off to see me in my play before my inevitable demise placed that faintly macabre pleasure beyond their reach. What happened is that dressing gown is going to become kind of important uh, as, as, the, as the years go by and as the image develops. So the vortex was a huge hit, um, and basically it ends with a rapprochement between the young man and his mom. Um, she convinces him that he needs to give up the cocaine, and he convinces her that she needs to give up the young boys and kind of do her thing. Um, marvelous stuff. It really is very potent for 1924. It's kind of cool. Then comes Private Lives in 1931. Now by this time, Coward and the dressing gown have become rather inseparable. Uh, it shows up in various incarnations in this play. Private Lives is 1930. Did I say 31? 1930. Um, and a couple of stories to spin out for you about this. This may be, this may be my favorite. Uh, it's a marvelous thing. It requires four actors of real, real, real competence because it's a marathon. It's a lot, a lot, a lot going on. In the picture with Noel Coward, you see his dear, dear friend, Gertrude Lawrence. He and Gertrude Lawrence were a match made in heaven. Um, they were a theatrical couple, uh, kind of like me and one other person who is present in this audience, who just know what the other one's going to do on stage. You sort of just kind of get the way it's going. And he and Gertrude Lawrence worked that way, in review, in cabaret, and in plays like Private Lives. You probably know her best as the original Mrs. Anna in The King and I. Uh, she is the one, Richard Rogers was skeptical, but they finally wrote the role for her, and she didn't get to play it long. Uh, she died not too long after the show opened. Um, but she was our very first one in The King and I. Elliot and Amanda are divorced from each other, and both are remarried to other people. They happen to be in the same hotel on their honeymoon in adjoining rooms. And so they've discovered themselves out on the balcony, and they're smoking, and they're reminiscing, and talking about how potent cheap music is, which is one of my favorite lines. And they discover that they really would rather be with each other than the people that they're married to. So they run away. And the middle part of the play are their present spouses trying to find where they are. 
And at the end of the play, everything works out the way it ought to with Elliot and Amanda back together with each other. But it may interest you to know that in this original company, the young husband of Amanda, whose name is Victor, was played by a then little known performer named Laurence Olivier, who had a nasty habit of breaking up on stage. And some of the cast members in Blythe Spirit had a bout of this the other night, as a matter of fact. But Noel Coward came to him and said, you're a giggler. And I and Gertrude Lawrence can make you giggle anytime we want to, and you know it. And we're going to, until you learn to quit giggling on stage. And Olivier himself tells the story, and he said it took him seven months. To find. You can just imagine these guys. Um, but private lives and his relationship with Gertrude Lawrence is really, really important. This became an international hit. Um, he brought this one to New York. And this is where he met some folks that will be influential later on. But he played this while he was working on one you may not have heard about. And I'll get to that one in a sec. In the meantime, the image is building. The image of the cigarette and the drink and the tuxedo and the dressing gown. The cigarette holder, when appropriate, as a matter of fact. So it's all very effete, and it's all very classy, and it's all very raconteur and man about town, and all of it invented. This is not the life he came from. These are not his origins, but he finds a comfort in this image, and the public likes it. So even if he looks like a doped-up Chinese illusionist, it works. And so people begin to expect the witty line and those sorts of things. Um, but this is the image that he begins to cultivate. And along the way, he picked up some rather interesting friends. So I wanted to share this with you. This is Gertrude Lawrence, out of character. And she had a huge career. She will reward your study because she did a lot, a lot of things. Um, this, anyone? This is Alexander Walcott. Alexander Walcott was a theater critic, author, um, curmudgeon, generally irascible dinner guest. Um, he could be a very dear friend or he, he could be a snarky adversary, just depending on how you caught him. Any of you familiar with the play called The Man Who Came to Dinner know who he is because Alexander Walcott was the model for Sheridan Whiteside. And a lot of Noel Coward's friends and acquaintances of this circle, which included Moss Hart and George S. Kaufman, who wrote the play, were also there, including Harpo Marx, who is the character of Banjo. He was a dear friend in this circle as well. And then over in the lower corner are Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontan. Any of you who are, are fans of um, Waiting for Guffman, you know that the local community theater stars are called the Lunts of Blaine. Well, that's where the reference comes from. Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine were the first couple of acting in the United States particularly. But they worked with Noel Coward in his, you know, you think cocaine and, and mom misbehaving was shocking. They were with him in a play called Design for Living. Design for Living involves two men and a woman who decide that that's just fine. <laughs> we're going to live this way and we're going to have a relationship and we don't care. So. Noel Coward was really kind of pushing the envelope on some of these things. Um, oddly enough, the film version of this, um, the woman is escaping me right now, but the men were Gary Cooper and Randolph Scott uh, in the film version. Private Lives was George Montgomery and Norma Shearer. And I'm sorry, you had me at Norma Shearer. She's kind of a major, major crush. But it's a good movie. Lots of fun. Hmm? I'm sorry. That's where you get Moon Over Buffalo. Yes, yes, a lot of that stuff. So anyway, some of the very luminary friends that, that, were, that were sort of accumulating along the way. Cavalcade is in 1933. I'm sorry, 31. And this is a show that I really don't understand how it ever occurred. Noel Coward was working in New York City in private lives, and he had brought with him a stack of back issues of the London Illustrated News because... He had seen a back page of one that had a big picture of a troop ship leaving for the Boer War. And he had this idea of telling 30 years of the lives of two London families. One basically above stairs and below stairs. So you've got the family and the family that works for them. Because the butler and the maid were, were, were married. And it's their story coming through all of these years. What's remarkable is... It's told in something like 22 scenes with a cast of 400 people. They acquired the Drury Lane, and Noel Coward and his designer, um, Gladys Calthrop, went to look at the place and realized 
this is going to be great, just as soon as we gut the entire interior and remodel it, which is what they did to the winter garden when cats moved in the first time. And for the same reasons, they needed lifts, they needed ways to move lots of scenery around quickly. And they did it. Coward would divide his chorus up by number and color so that he was able to say, okay, at this cue, seven red, come over and shake hands with 15 black and yellow, and that way they were able to get where they were going. He encouraged them to invent their own business so that it looked really natural and normal. And it is. It's 30 years of the lives of these families, from the Boer War to the end of the First World War. And that troop ship, that troop ship scene, you see right there. Live on stage, ladies and gentlemen, you got all of these people here, and then you've got your backdrop of the ship full of soldiers, and the thing pulls out while you're sitting there watching it. Nothing like it since the cotton blossom pulled into port in showboat without nearly this many people. The play became a huge success, even though, and I take great comfort in this, opening night, stuff quit working. The very first scene change, there's Sam going, uh, <laughs> the first scene change, one of the lifts jammed. And so Noel Coward, stiff upper lip and all, is sitting in his box knowing that everyone in the auditorium is looking at him. What's going on? Why is nothing happening? And he writes that as, there's no way any of us could flinch. We didn't dare. So they're just sitting there like it's perfectly normal. Four hours, it seemed. It was four minutes. And on the stage, that's an eternity. But it did. It finally started working, and people loved it. And let me share with you a little bit from the very end of the play. Um, the First World War is over. Um, Jane, who is our principal um, heroine, has lost just about her whole family to warfare one way or the other. Um, and so has her maid, Ellen. But here we are um, at the 11th hour of the 11th day, um, and she's out... She out, she's out uh, for, for, for that uh, scene. Before the scene begins, Jane appears far upstage in a pool of light. Her hat has been pushed onto one side, her clothes look disheveled, and her handbag hangs on her arm wide open. Twined round her neck and over her hat are colored paper streamers. Bear in mind she's just gotten the word that her son has died in the war. But she's out in this crowd with all of this going on. Incredibly deep stage, very wide, amazing. She holds in her left hand a large painted wooden rattle, in her right hand, a white and blue paper squeaker. Her face is dead white and quite devoid of expression. The lights go up. Jane can be seen threading her way like a sleepwalker through dense crowds of cheering, yelling people. They push her and jostle her. One man blows a long, squeaking paper tongue into her face. There is a motor bus festooned with people and a Rolls Royce and one or two taxis and a handsome cab, all equally burdened with screaming humanity. They move at a snail's pace. Jane finally arrives downstage under a lamppost in the center. She stands there, cheering wildly with the tears rolling down her face. I gotta tell you, um, there's a scene in this thing, and that, was, that one's completely nonverbal. That's the whole scene, just the noise and the shouting. But I wanted to share that there's a moment where one of her sons has married, and he and his wife are on a cruise. And they're talking about the uncertainty of the future and our lives together and all of this kind of thing. And then as they're leaving the scene, she takes her jacket off the rail, which has covered up the life preserver that says Titanic. Yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> so it's, it's all that kind of stuff. But at the end, I wanted to share this with you. Um, Jane is toasting the new year. It's 1929, turning to 30. First of all, my dear, I drink to you, loving, loyal and loving always. Now then, let's couple the future of England with the past of England, the glories and victories and triumphs that are over and the sorrows that are over too. Let's drink to our sons who made part of the pattern and to our hearts that died with them. Let's drink to the spirit of gallantry and courage that made a strange heaven out of unbelievable hell. And let's drink to the hope that one day this country of ours, which we love so much, will find dignity and greatness and peace again. Now. That's the end of that scene. The song that follows is a really crazy little thing called the 20th Century Blues. You need to go to YouTube and find it. There's lots of versions of it. But it's very cynical. It's very jaded. Um, it's talking about all the problems that are coming in the future. And then you get this tableau at the end. 
And if this don't make you stand up and cheer. When the song is finished, people rise from the table and dance without apparently any particular enjoyment. It is the dull dancing of habit. The lights fade away from everything but the dancers who appear to be rising in the air. They disappear, and downstage left, six incurables in blue hospital uniform are sitting making baskets. They disappear, and Fanny is seen singing her song for a moment. She's at a nightclub. Then far away upstage, a jazz band is seen playing wildly. Then downstage, Jane and Robert standing with glasses of champagne held aloft. Then Ellen sitting in front of a radio loudspeaker. Then Margaret dancing with a young man. The visions are repeated quicker and quicker while across the darkness runs a light sign spelling out the news. Noise grows louder and louder, steam rivets, loudspeakers, jazz bands, airplane propellers, until the general effect is complete chaos. Suddenly it all fades into darkness and silence, and away at the back, a Union Jack glows through the blackness. The lights slowly come up, and the whole stage is composed of massive tears upon which stand the entire company, the Union Jack flies over their heads as they sing, God Save the King. Okay? Now, Noel Coward had not intended this to become the nationalistic sort of icon that it did. But he came out on stage afterward for the author's speech, and his last line was something to the effect that it's pretty exciting to be English. So this got taken up by the English. Um, they had an election the next week, and this evidently had some effect on that. But here you are in the 30s. Um, all that they've come through, all that they're headed toward. You know, it's quite a remarkable moment. But that's Cavalcade, which surprisingly has never been revived. <laughs> Go figure. All right, which brings us to Blythe Spirit. Blythe Spirit is 1941. Who in the world sits down and writes a silly comedy like this in 1941? Well, the same people who do things like you can't take it with you and stuff like that. Um, Coward, when the war broke out, he went to find some legitimate wartime work. That's what he wanted to do, um, be a soldier or whatever it was going to take. They sent him instead to Paris where he ran the British propaganda office and also sent him to the United States. His job was to use his influence and his abilities to convince the other powers of the earth to join with England in this effort. Which got him a lot of criticism at home because people were like, look at Noel Coward dancing around the globe while all this is going, and he could never tell them why he was traveling. So he was doing some of that kind of operation um, in, the, in the early days of the war, and he went to Churchill and he said, look, I gotta do something. And Churchill says, you need to sing for the soldiers. So the very kind of work that Bob Hope was doing, Noel Coward was doing traveling around the Mediterranean, Africa, all sorts of places, India, different kinds of places, singing his songs, telling his stories, trying to keep the troop morale going up. In 1941, though, he has this idea. He hadn't really planned to write anything. He was going to take a summer off or something like that, but he had this notion. And so it, it hit him, it stuck with him. He went to a little town in Wales, resort community. I made the mistake of looking it up. I totally want to go there, okay, it's beautiful. He and his friends sat and looked at the sea and talked all morning about this, and the next morning he sat down, and six days later the play was done. And he says with no, no braggadocio or anything, he said, it was good. I knew where it was going. He said, any playwright who starts a play needs to have already written the last scene. So he knew where it was headed. The characters were very clear. And so in six days it was done, and he only ever changed two lines in the whole thing. So first draft worked in this case, but lots of, lots of cigarettes and typewriter paper. Um, and it went into rehearsal immediately. Blythe Spirit, I don't want to give too much of it away, but the title comes from Shelley and has very little to do with the play, except that there are ghosts in it. Uh, you have Blythe Spirits. And I wanted to call your attention to this character. Her name is Madame Arcati, and she is, um, she is the medium at the center of the may mayhem and the chaos that occurs in this play. Um, Noel Coward calls it an improbable farce in three acts, and it really is. Um, but what a tonic for the public in 1941. He describes the scene where people had to walk across bridges, board bridges over the rubble, 
to get into the theater because of the bombings that had been going on. At one point, he was staying at the Savoy when it took a direct hit in a bombing raid. And the place is crumbling, stuff's exploding. He's in the restaurant. So he hits the piano to keep all the rest of the patrons. It would have been worse to run outside. So he just started doing an impromptu show to keep everybody there in the restaurant. Um, the Savoy was so grateful that they moved him into a better room <laughs> for less money. So it was kind of a nice deal. But that's the kind of attitude that he had. Uh, very, that's the kind of spirit that, that he had. Um, Madame Arcati was intended to be a little minor part. But as he, as he wrote the play, it became more and more important that she be there more often than not. Film fans will recognize Margaret Rutherford. Um, she was an early and popular version of Miss Marple uh, in the movies. And she's also, um, she's also Miss Prism in a rather famous film version of The Importance of Being Earnest. Uh, Dame Edith Evans is Lady Bracknell, and uh, Margaret Rutherford is Madame Arcati. Bless your hearts, I can't tell you anything about this because it would give the play away. So anyway, there's Blythe Spirit. But I wanted to share that with you because it has never left the repertoire. This is the version that's playing now. Angela Lansbury has been playing Madame Arcati for a couple of years now in this country and over in the United Kingdom. She's not slowing down. I think she's about to hit 90. And she's not, she's, I think she's going on Game of Thrones is what I read last week. So I doubt that she'll be playing Madame Arcati on Game of Thrones. Um, but she's playing this now. And this, this one down here was just a neat historical artifact that I found because there was a television version of this. And this is Noel Coward. He played Charles Condamine a lot of times on tour. And this was a television version that was done with Claudette Colbert and Lauren Bacall, uh, which must have been quite remarkable. Oh, good. In 1955, Noel Coward reinvented himself again. Um, he's one of those figures who comes in and out of vogue. Um, people are quoting him, people are loving him, and then all of a sudden something else comes along, and we forget about him, and then, oh, he's still here. Um, it's remarkable, you may know Jerry Lewis is back. I was talking to a class this morning and nobody knew who he was, which was pretty remarkable. Um, I've heard the name, um, so I'm explaining to them who Jerry Lewis was, and he's at 90, 92, and he's got a new movie coming out, but that's the kind of deal, because here he is, and then he's not, and then he's back. Noel Coward went to Las Vegas in 1955 and constructed a cabaret act out of all of his stuff stories, some of which I've been telling you, songs, uh, and he was a huge hit, impressing people like Frank Sinatra, who are like, you got to go hear an old coward sing this song and stuff. So very successful, it's recorded so that you can go and listen to it if you like to. But again, another incarnation of, of what he was doing. Um, let me drop in one little footnote from a couple of minutes ago before we're done, because I really wanted to share this story with you. When he was auditioning for Cavalcade, they needed 400 people. And I think sometimes we, we seem to think that the Great Depression was ours, but it wasn't. It was all over. And so there was a depression in Great Britain as well. So a thousand people showed up to audition for the chorus part of Cavalcade. And Noel Coward says he was sitting there and it was the bleakest days he ever spent because coming across to play walk-ons and bit parts are important English actors. People who had been starring in plays for years. And here they are just trying to get something. Um, and then he looks over and his producer friend has these three girls. Oh, I've hired them. And Noel Coward's like, they're exactly what we don't need. Oh, no, no, they're going to be in the show. Okay, only if I get to hire two of these people for every one of those. And so that was the way it worked. So we got six more people on the payroll because of what the producer had done. Um, so... One bit of controversy to mention, one of his songs didn't go down quite so well. I encourage you to listen to this one, too. It's called Don't Let's Be Beastly to the Germans. And he, he wrote this one in 1943 because he was kind of disgusted. There was a segment of the population that was, oh, well, once this war is over, you know, it's okay. We don't need, you know, it's the same kind of reconstruction or not reconstruction argument we had in this country. But 
Noel Coward was kind of upset that folks were being very accommodating and very conciliatory and that kind of stuff. So he writes this wonderful song called Don't Let's Be Beastly to the Germans, where he's advocating being completely beastly to them, but in his satirical sort of witty sort of way. Well, some people misunderstood, and they thought that Noel Coward was a collaborator because he actually thought we shouldn't be this way. So that, that finally cleared up too. He basically was able to weather controversy by ignoring a lot of it. You know, he's like, whatever, you know, you're wrong. We're going to do it this way. Knighted, in 1969, several people thought it should have come sooner. Um, some people thought he shot himself in the foot once upon a time, because with Cavalcade, the urban legend is, well, you're going to receive a knighthood for this. And he allegedly said, well, nothing less than a peerage for something of this quality. And so the talk was that that got back to Buckingham Palace. And I, I you know, no knighthood for you. But he did finally get it uh, around about his 70th birthday. And so with a characteristic pose, let me play us out with what is probably my favorite of his songs. This is called Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. The profession is overcrowded and the struggle is pretty tough. And admitting the fact she's burning to act, that isn't quite enough. She has nice hands to give the wretched girl her due. But don't you think her bust is too developed for her age? I repeat, Mrs. Worthington, sweet Mrs. Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. Regarding your... Dear Mrs. Worthington, of Wednesday the 23rd, although your baby may be keen on a stage career, how can I make it clear this is not a good idea for her to hope, dear Mrs. Worthington, is on the face of it absurd. Her personality is not in reality exciting enough, inviting enough for this particular sphere. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. She's a bit of an ugly duckling, you must honestly confess. And the width of her seat would surely defeat her chances of success. It's a loud voice. And though it's not exactly flat, she'll need a little more than that to earn a living wage on my knees, Mrs. Worthington. Please, Mrs. Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. Though they said at the School of Acting she was lovely as Pierre Gint, I'm afraid on the whole an ingenue role would emphasize her squint. She's a big girl. And though her teeth are fairly good, she's not the type I ever would be eager to engage. No more butts, Mrs. Worthington. Nuts, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming today. Appreciate it. There's time for a question or two if anybody has one. Well, I think gone. Yes. I'm not going to tell you. You might go. It's, uh, it's uh, Port Marion. It's tucked into a little teeny bay. It's just, ugh, wonderful. How could you not write a hit play? All righty then. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.